Palm Sunday, 1984, I will never, never forget. And, and I'm reminded every Palm Sunday. New York City police are investigating the mass murder of 10 people found shot to death late today in a Brooklyn home. The faces of those kids still haunt me to this day. We're here in the East New York section of Brooklyn, where on Palm Sunday, 1984, a family in the house behind me were having snacks watching TV when a gunman entered their home. 10 people dead, two women and eight children. The children aged three through 14. One of the dead women was eight months pregnant. It was the largest mass shooting in New York City at the time. I don't think any of us have, has ever seen a shooting uh, like this. For InsideEdition.com, I'm Sal Bono, and this is New York Gritty. I'm standing in front of 1080 Liberty Avenue, which is where the crime occurred on the first floor of this building. It's now been converted to a business. In 1984, East New York was a very rough, tough neighborhood. Now, you can see there's a lot of foot traffic, a lot of commercial businesses, a lot of people going about their everyday lives. When I was a cop and a detective in New York City back in those days, crime was prevalent all over the city. The way things are, from a couple of years on, things are real horrible here in New York, all over. You're dealing with a lot of uh, people that are maniacs today. We had over 100 murders a year in East New York, and the crime was just so prevalent in that area for murders. It was actually called the killing fields. Bo Deedle is a retired NYPD homicide detective. He was part of the team from the 75th Precinct that investigated the crime known as the Palm Sunday Massacre. It was a really torrential rain day. I've never seen rain like it before or after it. It was just, it, that's one of the vivid memories of my mind. So that day, I wasn't working. I always called into the squad, what's going on? And then I called in there and I got Joe Hall on the phone. Usually when you arrive, you see a guy say, hey Joe, how you doing? tell you what you got, but you could see on the faces, as I remember now, remembering now, faces, everybody was very solemn. You know, like, it was no joke. And he said, oh, we got five, six dead on Liberty Avenue. I said, what? So immediately upon me hearing this, I got in my car and I shot in. When I walked in, I was in disbelief. I walked in and um, I saw the first victim on the bed. He was four years old. I saw him lying on the bed. And, and next day, the bed, at the foot of the bed, there was a pool of blood. It was sort of like a real railroad flat, one room into the next, into the next, into the next. The next room is where we saw most of the bodies there, mostly children, eight children. Then there was a, a, an adult woman sitting in the center of the room with the children surrounding her, and she had her eyes open, head back, with the round to the head and blood coming down, and, but she had a little jar of pudding in her left hand, and in her right hand was a spoon. And she was just staring straight ahead with the television on. It was a very eerie sight to see. Eight children, whose ages ranged from three to 14, were found shot to death inside the apartment, along with two women, one of whom was eight months pregnant. The only survivor was a baby girl who was about a year old. The detectives on the scene say they're still haunted by what they saw. To see this with the bullet holes in these children and see them lying on the floor, I'll never forget it, you know, I'll never forget it. But this is the picture that always, because uh, you, you don't see any blood. This little girl, a pretty little face, and look at, you know. Investigators here from the 7-5 precinct assembled the largest task force since the Son of Sam shootings to catch their killer. You know, whoever did this, you don't know where he's going to stop. Is there a list of victims that he's going to? Is there somebody else he has on his agenda? When I came back to the precinct, I told Lieutenant Holman, they said, Lieutenant, I got all my homicides are cleared up. I says, I want to be involved with this case. I, I want to catch whoever did this to this family and to these kids. It took weeks of investigation. Bo says the break in the case came from a tip called into 911, claiming a man named Christopher Thomas may have been the one who committed the heinous crime. Some guy from 911 worked on a 911 communication with the police department, mentioned this Christopher Thomas for the first time. Now, the problem with this is that the father of the deceased kids was a drug dealer too, Bermudez. He was dealing drugs, so we had to get his cooperation. So we had to go to the Brooklyn District Attorney's Office and give this guy immunity so he would talk to us. Now we got him. 
and we're asking him questions. And one of the things that he mentioned, well, who could have done this? He mentioned about $7,000 owed to him by one Christopher Thomas. So now we heard the name again after the 911. So like little lights go off. Wow, now we're focusing on something. So then we find out that he owed the money. So in my mind is, why would someone kill everybody unless they knew him? And he had been there dealing, buying drugs there. So it was obvious he had to wipe out everybody. Investigators were able to track Thomas down to a city jail in the Bronx, where he was being held on suspicion of another crime. His lawyer claimed that he was high at the time when he killed the family. Thomas was put on trial and convicted, but not for murder. So they came back with a manslaughter conviction, meaning that because he smoked crack cocaine, he didn't know what he was doing. That's a load of bull So if you want to go kill somebody, do a couple of lines of coke, go whack them. And that's going to be the same defense, which is ridiculous. These little kids will never, ever have a life. There'll be no Easter, there'll be no, no Christmas. They're dead. In 1985, Christopher Thomas was sentenced to a maximum of 250 years behind bars. As I was researching this story, I started making calls to find out how Thomas was doing in prison. But he wasn't in prison at all. In January of this year, Christopher Thomas was released from prison. After serving 33 years, Thomas quietly walked out of prison on a conditional release because of good behavior. When I told Bo, he couldn't believe it. When I get the call from Inside Edition, when he was released, that's the only time I heard about this. Honestly, when you called me and told me he was out, I was shocked. We broke the story of Thomas's release, and local politicians immediately hopped on it. They held the news conference. It was a sad, sad day. I mean, nobody, uh, everybody remembers that. It's like uh, when you kill a family like that, it's like the murder of John F. Kennedy. It's like, it's something that's in your head uh, that never gets out of your head. It's something as a police officer, as a person that has a family that grew up in our communities here, believe me, it's something that never leaves you. This guy does not belong on the street. Good behavior. These kids were in good behavior. They're watching television. They were in good behavior. He's in jail. You're supposed to have good behavior. And the crime that he committed he should never have seen the light of day. I'm not saying he should have gotten a death penalty, but he should never have been allowed to walk the streets. And in this particular case, I'll make an exception. He should have gotten the death penalty. Yeah. But defense attorney Ron Kuby, who has no connection to the case, says the release was legal and justified. People say, who in the world paroled this guy? Who are the people who said he should be paroled? Uh, and the truth is, nobody said he should be paroled. His release was required under the law. Christopher Thomas, if you have to remember, was convicted of 10 counts of manslaughter, not murder. Had he been convicted of, of murder, even one count of murder, he might very well be in prison. I think that uh, certainly there are some people who are so dangerous after 10 or 20 or 30, 40, 50 years, who are so dangerous that they have to be separated from society. And there is actually a mechanism to do that. But, but how much punishment, I mean, really? 30 years of punishment, 40 years of, of punishment? In my legal opinion, American sentencing is far too harsh to begin with. We impose the longest sentences in the Western world by a factor of two or three. Uh, other people in other countries commit really bad murders too, and yet uh, they are not put in prison for the rest of their lives. They are successfully rehabilitated. The detectives say now that Thomas is out, they don't believe justice was served. First call I made was to Jaffe. She was a policewoman at the time, a, a patrol on patrol, brand new. Joanne Jaffe was on the scene that day and held the surviving child, a little girl named Christina. And I talked to her and uh, I just couldn't believe it. I said, I'm, I'm shocked. Jaffe kept in touch with the child as she grew up and several years ago officially adopted her as her daughter. Jaffe is now retired. Much has changed in the past 34 years, but these detectives say they're uneasy knowing that the man who committed this crime is walking the streets again. There, especially in incidences like this, um, the detectives should go up there and, and show crime scene photos 
because I think that if you looked at these photos and they saw what we saw that day, they would do anything, I would like to think that they would do anything they could to make sure that these people that are, are, that are capable of doing things like this never get back out into society. There's no doubt if this man lives any length of time, he'll do something else again as far as I'm concerned. You believe that? I do believe that. Even oh, I at do. 68? Even at 68. Oh yeah, 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 I do believe he'll do something.